Life was good for the West Virginia coal operators. By 1900, Fayette County's 8,000 miners produced 5 million tons of coal. Profits were high, and West Virginia's population grew 27.4% due to plentiful job opportunities. From an outsider's perspective, all seemed well. This, however, was not the case. These men were slaves, and they were suffering from a tyrant's rule. Life had always been hard for the West Virginia coal miners. They worked long hours for low pay in dangerous mines. The dollars that the miners were given to them was in company script, a company form of currency, which private merchants would pay 25 to 30 percent less than its dollar value. 79 percent of all West Virginia coal miners lived in company housing and had to buy their necessities at their company store, which racked up prices 5 to 12 percent more than independent merchants. All of this ate away at the miners' money leaving little left. Though it seemed impossible, on January 23, 1890, men from all over the country piled into the meeting house of Columbus, Ohio. These men were miners who had faced the hardships of the system that they were born into. There were speeches throughout the day, and by the end, the United Mine Workers of America was formed. The new union had a rough time starting out in West Virginia, with their members being fired and companies hiring scabs, which are imported workers, to take union members' jobs. To keep the union under control, mine owners hired Baldwin Feltz agents to be private guards for them. Though the union was beginning to have effect in West Virginia, this did not stop the accidents which were so common in mines from happening. Because of West Virginia's relaxed mine safety laws, hundreds of miners died every year in preventable accidents, despite mine owners stating that 99% of all mine accidents were due to the carelessness of mine workers. And to make matters worse, coal companies began to introduce a new form of weighing coal called the long ton which allowed mine operators to pay the same amount of money as a ton, though weighing more. With all of this, in the year of 1912, Paint Creek miners went on strike and had guerrilla fights with scab trains, but all came to a head during the Battle of Mucklow, which took place between July 26th to 28th in the town of Mucklow, when miners attacked Baldwin Feltz agents killing four guards and twelve strikers, causing the National Guard to break up the fighting and be stationed in the area temporarily. After the death of miner Sesco Estep, who was killed by an armored train, tensions in West Virginia began to rise once again. To try to stop war from happening, Governor Henry D. Hatfield shut down prominent socialist newspapers such a violation of the First Amendment had not occurred since the American Civil War. When war broke out in Europe, the West Virginia Union took advantage of the high demand for coal. Soon miners in Cabin Creek were making far better wages than any other miners in the Kanawha coal field. The Great War was one of the best things that could have happened to the coal industry. In 1917, the 6,000 collieries in West Virginia produced 90 million tons of coal, and company profits rose by 500%. The Great War started a lust for democracy within the American worker. In 1919, 4.2 million workers engaged in strikes all over America, twice as many than in 1917. And on November 1st, 50,000 West Virginia coal miners joined the already 300,000 other industrial workers in one of the biggest strikes in American history. 
ending with a 14% pay raise. Tensions continued to rise in West Virginia, and when Governor Morgan denied union requests, 1,000 miners gathered at Lynn's Creek Hollow, just 10 miles from the state capital, with thousands more armed and ready. Soon, 8,000 armed miners, many having fought in the Great War, were participating in a mass protest, and the number soon grew to 10,000, the largest civil insurrection since the Civil War. Fearing an all-out war, Logan County Sheriff Don Chaffin fortified Blair Mountain with 700 men, determined to push the strikers back. Two civilian armies were about to face off against each other, just 200 miles from the nation's capital. On August 31st, with temperatures reaching 90 degrees, columns of miners moved out of their camp and up the mountainside. And that afternoon, fighting began on the slopes of Blair Mountain. Sheriff Don Chaffin and his men, already fortified, held back their attackers with their machine guns, holding back charge after charge. That same day, strikers fighting up towards Crooked Creek saw something different in the sky than the airplanes which had been watching them all day. A biplane swooped down into the valley and began dropping gas and pipe bombs on the strikers. This event was the first and only time American citizens were subjected to an aerial bombardment on their own soil. The battle continued over the next few days with fighting raging throughout Blair Mountain and Crooked Creek, with miners slowly pushing up the mountainside. But when word arrived that on September 2nd, Secretary of War Newton D. Baker ordered a force of 2,100 U.S. infantrymen to stop the fighting, the largest peacetime deployment since 1890. When the strikers heard the news, cheers were heard all over the mountainside, and fighting soon stopped. The Battle of Blair Mountain was costly for the Union strikers. Fifty of their ranks died, with fifty more being wounded. Though the Battle of Blair Mountain gave nationwide attention to the coal unions, miners continued to be mistreated. A U.S. district judge granted permanent injunction against union activities where miners signed yellow dog contracts, making them agree to not join the union. Renowned union activist Mother Jones had this to say about the West Virginia Hills. There is never peace in West Virginia because there is never justice. When the Great Depression hit the coal fields, an already suffering group of people suffered far more in a level of poverty rarely witnessed by the United States. With all the job uncertainties the Depression brought, miners knew that they needed to stand together. In the first six months of 1931, the United Mine Workers Association received 23,000 new members. When President Roosevelt was elected, new labor provisions kept the union alive, with workers gathering to join it in once bloody towns. To prevent another mine war from starting, the United Mine Workers of America formed an agreement with Appalachian coal operators, achieving a 40-hour work week and a base rate of pay close to UMWA standards. Because of these agreements, fatalities in mines decreased by one-third, and the future began to look bright for the revived Union. The private guard system had fallen, and the wage for bituminous coal miners had doubled. But with the rise of UMWA President Tony Boyle, the organization became even more out of touch with its members, spending $1.4 million on their annual meeting and making it impossible to have a new leader with bribes and rigged elections. A new era had come to the once glorious Union. But the coal miners, the workers who were the backbone of American society, would see it through, just like they had always done.